Saint Simeon the New Theologian On Faith Brethren and fathers, it is good that we make God's mercy known to all and speak to those close to us of the compassion and inexpressible bounty He has shown us. For as you know, I neither fasted, nor kept vigils, nor slept on bare ground, but to borrow the psalmist's words, I humbled myself, and in short, the Lord saved me. Or to put it even more briefly, I did no more than believe and the Lord accepted me. See Psalms 116, 6, and 10, and 27, 10. Many things stand in the way of our acquiring humility, but there is nothing that prevents us from having faith. For if we want it with all our heart, it will immediately become active in us, since it is God's gift to us, and a preeminent characteristic of our nature, even though it is also subject to our individual power of free will. That is why even Scythians and other outlandish peoples have faith in each other's words. Yet, to demonstrate through actual facts the effect of our deeply rooted faith, and to confirm what I have just said, I will tell you a story related to me by someone who was entirely trustworthy. A man by the name of George, young in age, he was about twenty, was living in Constantinople during our times. He was good-looking, and so studied in dress, manners, and gait, that some of those who take note only of outer appearances and harshly judge the behavior of others began to harbor malicious suspicions about him. This young man then made the acquaintance of a holy monk who lived in one of the monasteries in the city, and to him he opened his soul, and from him he received a short rule which he had to keep in mind. He also asked him for a book giving an account of the ways of monks and their ascetic practices, so the elder gave him the work of Mark the Monk on the spiritual law. This the young man accepted as though it had been sent by God himself, and in the expectation that he would reap richly from it, he read it from end to end with eagerness and attention. And though he benefited from the whole work, there were three passages only which he fixed in his heart. The first of these three passages read as follows, If you desire spiritual health, listen to your conscience, do all it tells you, and you will benefit. The second passage read, He who seeks the energies of the Holy Spirit before he has actively observed the commandments is like someone who sells himself into slavery, and who as soon as he is bought, asks to be given his freedom while still keeping his purchase money. And the third passage said the following, Blind is the man crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Luke 18.38 He prays with his body alone, and not yet with spiritual knowledge. But when the man once blind received his sight and saw the Lord, he acknowledged him no longer as the Son of David, but as the Son of God, and worshipped him. See John 9.38 On reading these three passages, the young man was struck with awe and fully believed that if he examined his conscience he would benefit, that if he practiced the commandments he would experience the energy of the Holy Spirit, and that, through the grace of the Holy Spirit, he would recover his spiritual vision and would see the Lord. Wounded thus with love and desire for the Lord, he expectantly sought his primal beauty, however hidden it might be. And he assured me he did nothing else except carry out every evening before he went to bed the short rule given to him by the holy elder, when his conscience told him, make more prostrations, recite additional psalms, and repeat, Lord have mercy, more often, for you can do so. He readily and unhesitatingly obeyed, and did everything as though asked to do it by God himself. And from that time on, he never went to bed with his conscience reproaching him and saying, Why have you not done this? Thus, as he followed it scrupulously, and as daily it increased its demands, in a few days he had greatly added to his evening office. 
During the day he was in charge of a patrician's household, and each day he went to the palace, engaging in the tasks demanded by such a life, so that no one was aware of his other pursuits. Every evening tears flowed from his eyes. He multiplied the prostrations he made with his face to the ground, his feet together and rooted to the spot on which he stood. He prayed assiduously to the Mother of God with sighs and tears, and as though the Lord was physically present, he fell at his most pure feet, while like the blind man he besought mercy and asked that the eyes of his soul should be opened. As his prayers lasted longer every evening, he continued in this way until midnight, never growing slack or indolent during this period, his whole body under control, not moving his eyes or looking up, he stood still as a statue or a bodiless spirit. One day, as he stood repeating more in his intellect than with his mouth, the words, God have mercy upon me a sinner, Luke 18, 13. Suddenly a profuse flood of divine light appeared above him and filled the whole room. As this happened, the young man lost his bearings, forgetting whether he was in a house or under a roof, for he saw nothing but light around him and did not even know that he stood upon the earth. He had no fear of falling or awareness of the world, nor did any of those things that beset men and bodily beings enter his mind. Instead, he was wholly united to non-material light, so much so that it seemed to him that he himself had been transformed into light. Oblivious of all else, he was filled with tears and inexpressible joy and gladness. Then his intellect ascended to heaven and beheld another light, more lucid than the first. Miraculously there appeared to him standing close to that light the holy angelic elder of whom we have spoken and who had given him the short rule and the book. When I heard this story, I thought how greatly the intercession of this saint had helped the young man, and how God had chosen to show him to what heights of virtue the holy man had attained. When this vision was over, the young man, as he told me, had come back to himself. He was struck with joy and amazement. He wept with all his heart, and sweetness mingled with his tears. Finally he fell on his bed, and at that moment the cock crowed, announcing the middle of the night. Shortly after, the church bells rang for matins, and he got up as usual to chant the office, not having had a thought of sleep during the whole night. As God knows, for he brings things about according to decisions of which he alone is aware, all this happened without the young man having done anything more than you have heard. But what he did, he did with true faith and unhesitating expectation. And let it not be said that he did these things by way of an experiment, for he had never spoken or thought of acting in such a spirit. Indeed, to make experiments and to try things out is evidence of a lack of faith. On the contrary, after rejecting every passion-charged and self-indulgent thought, this young man, as he himself assured me, paid such attention to what his conscience said that he regarded all material things of life with indifference and did not even find pleasure in food and drink or want to partake of them frequently. You have heard, my brethren, what great things faith in God can bring about when it is confirmed by actions. You will have realized that youth is not to be despised and that without understanding and fear of God, old age is useless. You have learnt that the heart of a city cannot prevent us from practicing God's commandments so long as we are diligent and watchful. Nor can stillness or withdrawal from the world be of any benefit if we are lazy and negligent. We have certainly all heard of David, and we admire him and say that he is unique and there cannot be another like him. Yet here, lo and behold, is something more than David. For David was especially chosen by God. He was anointed to be prophet and king. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he was granted many revelations concerning God. Thus, when he sinned, he was deprived of the grace of the Spirit and of his gift of prophecy, and was estranged from his usual communion with God. Is there anything astonishing in the fact that he should recall the state of grace from which he had fallen, 
and should ask to enjoy those privileges once more. See Psalms 51, 11 through 12. But our young man had never even conceived of any of these things. He was devoted only to what is transient and worldly, and he could imagine nothing superior to such things. Yet, how unpredictable are thy ways, Lord! He had only to hear of these divine realities, and he believed in them immediately. Indeed, he believed so surely that he implemented his faith in corresponding action. It was thanks to this action that his mind took wing and rose to heaven, drawing to it the compassion of Christ's mother. Through her intercession God was appeased and bestowed upon him the grace of the Spirit. This gave him the strength to rise to heaven and to behold the light that everyone longs for, but very few attain. This young man had not observed long fasts or slept on the ground, worn a hair shirt or shaved his beard, nor had he shunned the world physically, though he had in spirit by keeping a few vigils, yet he appeared to be superior to Lot, so renowned in Sodom. See Genesis 19. Or rather, although in a body, he was an angel, constrained yet unconstrained, visible but transcending physicality, human in appearance but immaterial when perceived spiritually, outwardly all things to all men. See 1 Corinthians 9, 22. But inwardly, solely present to God alone, the knower of all things. Thus, when the visible sun set, he found that its place was taken by the tender light of spiritual luminosity, which is the pledge and foretaste of the unceasing light that is to succeed it. And this was as it should be, for the love of that for which he was searching took him out of the world, beyond nature and all material things, filling him wholly with the Spirit and transforming him into light. And all this happened to him while he was living in the middle of the city and was steward of a house, having in his charge slaves and free men, and carrying out all the tasks incumbent on such a life. Enough has been said in praise of this young man, and to stimulate you to a similar longing in imitation of him. Or would you still like me to speak of other things greater than these, things which perhaps you might not be able to take in? Yet what can be greater? or more perfect than the fear of God. Indeed, nothing is greater than this. It is, as St. Gregory of Nazianzus has written, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 For where there is fear, there the commandments are kept, and where the commandments are kept, the flesh is purified, together with the cloud that envelops the soul and prevents it from clearly seeing the divine radiance. Where there is this purification, there is illumination, and illumination is the fulfillment of the longing of those who desire the greatest of all supernal things, or even that which is above all greatness. With these words he showed that illumination by the Spirit is the endless end of every virtue, and that whoever attains it has finished with everything sensory, and has begun to experience the knowledge of spiritual realities. Such, my brethren, are the wonders of God, and God reveals His hidden saints, so that some may emulate them, and others have no excuse for not doing so. Provided they live a worthy life, both those who choose to dwell in the midst of noise and hubbub, and those who dwell in monasteries, mountains, and caves, can achieve salvation. Solely because of the faith in Him, God bestows great blessings on them. Hence, those who because of their laziness have failed to attain salvation will have no excuse to offer on the day of judgment. For he who promised to grant us salvation simply on account of our faith in him is not a liar. So show mercy to yourselves and to us who love you and often grieve and shed tears for you. For this is what the merciful and compassionate God has asked us to do. Trust in the Lord with all your soul. Leave the world and everything that passes away, and draw close to God, and cleave to Him, for in a little while heaven and earth will pass away. Matthew 24, 35 And apart from Him 
there will be no firm ground on which to stand, no limit, nothing to check the fall of sinners. God is infinite and cannot be grasped. Tell me then, if you can, what place there will be for those who fall away from his kingdom. I grieve, I exhaust my heart, I pine for you when I bring to mind that we have a Lord so bountiful and compassionate that simply if we have faith in him he grants us gifts beyond our imagination, gifts we have never heard or thought of and that man's heart has not grasped. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 Yet we, like beasts, prefer the earth and the things of the earth, that through his great mercy it yields in order to supply our bodily needs, and if we use these things modestly, then our soul may ascend unhampered towards divine realities, nourished spiritually by the Holy Spirit, according to the degree of our purification and to the level to which we have ascended. This is our purpose, for this we were created and brought forth, that after having received lesser blessings in this world, we may, through our gratitude to God and our love for Him, enjoy great and eternal blessings in the life to come. But alas, far from having any concern for the blessings in store, we are even ungrateful for those at hand, and we are like demons, or, if truth be told, even worse. Thus we deserve greater punishment than they, for we have been given greater blessings, for we know that God became for our sakes like us in everything except sin, so that he might deliver us from delusion and free us from sin. But what is the use of saying this? The truth is that we believe in all these things only as words, while we deny them where our acts are concerned. Is not Christ's name uttered everywhere? in towns and villages, in monasteries, and on mountains. Search diligently, if you will, and find out whether anyone keeps his commandments. Among thousands of myriads you will scarcely find one who is a Christian, both in word and in act. Did not our Lord and God say in the Gospel, He that believes in me will also do what I do. Indeed, he will do greater things. John 14, 12. But which of us dares to say, I do Christ's work, and I truly believe in Christ? Do you not see, brethren, that on the day of judgment we risk being classed among the unbelievers, and we will be chastised more severely, even than those ignorant of Christ? Inevitably, either we must be chastised as unbelievers, or Christ is a liar, and that, my brethren, is impossible. I have written this not to dissuade you from withdrawing from the world or to encourage you to live in the midst of it. Rather, I have written it so that all who happen to read it may be assured that whoever wants to act rightly will receive from God the power so to do, wherever he may be. In fact, the tale I have told actually encourages withdrawal. For if the young man in question who lived in the world and never had a thought of renouncing it, or of shedding his possessions or of submitting to the rule of obedience, received such mercy from God simply because he trusted in him and called on him with his whole soul, how much greater blessings should those who hope to attain and have abandoned all worldly concerns and all worldly relationships, and who, as God commanded, have for his sake surrendered their very souls to death, See Luke 14, 26. Moreover, if unhesitating in your faith and wholehearted in your determination, you do begin to act rightly and to experience the blessing that comes from so doing, you will of your own accord realize that worldly cares and living in the world are a great obstacle to those who wish to live in conformity with God. What we have related about this young man is amazing and unexpected and we have never heard of anything like it happening to anyone else. Even though it may have happened to others or may happen in the future, they should realize that they will lose the blessing they have received unless they do promptly abandon the world. This is exactly what I learned from that young man. I subsequently met him after he had become a monk. 
in the third or fourth year of his monastic life. He was then thirty-two. I knew him very well. We had been friends from childhood and had been brought up together. On account of all this, he also told me the following. A few days after that incredible change in my life and the more than human help I received, I was continually attacked by the temptations of my worldly life, temptations that thwarted my secret activities and that little by little deprived me of the blessings I had been given. As a result, I longed to get completely away from the world and in solitude to seek out him who had appeared to me. For brother, I was convinced that he had appeared to me solely in order to draw me, unworthy as I was, to himself, to separate me entirely from the world. Yet lacking the strength to respond straight away, I gradually forgot everything I have told you about and fell into utter darkness to such an extent that I no longer remembered or even thought of anything major or minor connected with those experiences. Rather, I plunged into evil ways more deeply than ever before, and ended up in such a state that it was as if I had never understood or heard Christ's holy words. Even the saint who had once shown me such mercy, and who had given me that short rule, and had sent me that book, became for me merely someone I had happened to meet, and I gave no thought to the things that I had seen because of him. I am telling you this, he continued, so you can see quite clearly the pit of perdition into which I fell, contemptible as I was, because of my sloth and negligence. And so you will be filled with amazement at the inexpressible blessings that God subsequently bestowed on me. For though I do not know how to explain it, unknown to myself. Love and trust toward that saintly elder had remained in my unhappy heart, and it was, I think, for this reason that, as a result of his prayers, after many years, God, in his compassion, had mercy on me. Through him, God again dragged me out of my chronic state of delusion and rescued me from the pit of evil. In spite of my unworthiness, I had not completely broken with the elder. But when I was in the city, I often visited him in his cell and confessed to him what had happened to me, although without conscience as I was, I did not carry out any of his instructions. But now, as you see, the merciful God has forgiven my many sins, and through that same saintly elder has granted me the grace to become a monk, and, in spite of my being truly unworthy of it, has permitted me to be constantly with him. After great labors and many tears combined with strict solitude, total obedience, the complete elimination of my own will, and many other rigorous practices and actions, I have been going forward resolutely and unremittingly along my path, and have again been granted a vision faint as it is, of a small ray of that most gentle divine light, although up to now I have not been privileged to see it as I saw it on that original occasion. This and many other things he told me with tears, and I, hapless that I am, as I listened to his holy words, realized that he was entirely filled with divine grace, and was truly wise, despite his lack of worldly wisdom. Moreover, since he had acquired his unerring knowledge of spiritual realities through actual experience, I asked him to tell me how faith could bring about such miracles, and to instruct me by setting it down in writing. He began to speak to me about these matters and was quite ready to write down his observations. Not to lengthen this present text, I have set forth what he said elsewhere for the delight of those who seek with faith to learn from such writings. Thus I beg you, brethren in Christ, let us also diligently follow the path of Christ's commandments, so that our faces are not covered in shame. See Psalms. 34. 5. To everyone who knocks resolutely he opens the gates of his kingdom, and on him who asks he at once bestows the Holy Spirit. See Luke 11. 13. Nor is it possible for the person who seeks with all his soul not to find. See Matthew 7. 7-8. Seven and not to be enriched with the richness of his gifts. 
Thus, you too will be nourished by the inexpressible blessings that he has prepared for those who love him. See 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Here, in this present life, you will enjoy them in part, in accordance with his supernal wisdom, while in the life to come, you will enjoy them fully, in company with the saints of all time, in Christ Jesus our Lord, to whom be glory throughout the ages. Amen. Saint Simeon, the New Theologian 153 Practical and Theological Texts 1. To have faith is to die for Christ and for His commandments, to believe that this death brings life, to regard poverty as wealth and lowliness and humiliation as true glory and honor, to believe that by not possessing anything, one possesses everything. See 2 Corinthians 6, 9-10. Or rather, that not possessing anything is to possess the unsearchable riches of the knowledge of Christ. Ephesians 3, 8. And to look upon all visible things as dross and smoke. 2. To have faith in Christ means not only to stand aloof from the delights of this life, but also to endure patiently every temptation and test that brings upon us distress, affliction, and misfortune, for as long as God wishes, and until He comes to us. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He heard me. Psalms 40, 1 3. Those who in any way esteem their parents above the commandments of God do not possess faith in Christ. See Matthew 10, 37. Their own conscience will certainly accuse them if their conscience is still alive to their lack of faith. People who possess faith never transgress at any point the commandment of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 4. Faith in God engenders desire for spiritual blessings and fear of punishment. Desire for spiritual blessings and fear of punishment induce a strict keeping of the commandments. The strict keeping of the commandments teaches us our own weakness. Awareness of our true weakness generates mindfulness of death. The person who is mindful of death will insistently strive to discover what awaits him after his exit from this present life. But he who seeks to know what is to come should first of all detach himself from the things of this world. For whoever is constrained by an attachment, however small, to these things, cannot acquire full knowledge of his post-mortal state. Even should God in his mercy give him some taste of this knowledge, it will be taken away from him, unless he speedily severs his worldly attachment and dedicates himself wholly to it, not willingly giving thought to anything extraneous to it. 5. The Renunciation of and total separation from this world, which includes self-alienation from all material things, from the modes, attitudes, and forms of this present life, as well as the denial of one's own body and will, swiftly brings great rewards whenever it is zealously accomplished. 6. If you are intent on renouncing the world, do not permit yourself the solace of dwelling in it for the time being even if all your relatives and friends try to compel you to do so. It is the demons who provoke them in this way in order to extinguish the ardor of your heart. For even if they cannot thwart your purpose completely, they will try to slacken and enfeeble it. 7. When you are courageously impervious to all the pleasures of this life, then the demons will promote in your relatives a spurious compassion for you, making them weep and lament over you before your eyes. You will realize that it is spurious when you stick firmly to your purpose, for you will then see them becoming suddenly infuriated with you. They will no longer want to set eyes on you and will reject you as if you were an enemy. 8. When you see the pain which your parents, relatives, and friends experience because of you, mock the demon who in his subtlety has provoked these feelings against you. 
Withdraw with fear and determination and entreat God insistently to bring you swiftly into His haven, where He will give rest to your tired and overburdened soul. The sea of life nourishes many forms of danger and even of utter destruction. 9. He who would hate the world must love God from the depths of his soul and always have him in mind. Nothing else leads us to abandon the world more joyfully and to turn away from it as though it were so much trash. 10. Once called, do not seek to remain in the world for any reason at all, good or bad. Obey the call straight away. God rejoices at nothing so much as our promptitude, and swift obedience involving a life of frugality is better than procrastination amidst great wealth. 11. If the world and everything in it passes away, while God alone is eternal and immortal, then rejoice, since for His sake you have renounced what is corruptible, not merely wealth and possessions, but every sensual pleasure and sinful enjoyment are corruptive. Only the commandments of God are light and life, and everyone acknowledges them as such. 12. If, brother, consumed by spiritual ardor you have entered a monastery or placed yourself under a spiritual father, do not indulge in baths, food, or other bodily consolations, even if urged to do so by your spiritual father himself or by your monastic brethren. On the contrary, always be ready to fast, to endure hardship, to exercise the utmost self-control. If, however, your spiritual father insists that you should enjoy some comfort, you will obey him, not even in such a case acting according to your own will. But if he does not insist, then gladly endure what you have freely chosen to do, and your soul will benefit. By keeping to this rule, you will find that always, in every situation, you are abstinent and self-controlled, prompt to renounce your own will in all things. Moreover, you will keep a light in your heart, that flame which constrains you to stand aloof from everything. 13. When the demons have done all they can to shake our resolve to live a spiritual life and to hinder us from carrying it out, and have failed in their efforts, they enter pious hypocrites, and through them try to obstruct us. First, if moved by love and compassion, they exhort us to give our bodies some relaxation on the grounds that otherwise we will become physically exhausted and listless. Then, they invite us to join in useless discussion, making us waste whole days in them. If we pay attention to these hypocrites and model ourselves on them, the demons change tactics, mocking us for falling in this way. But if we take notice of their suggestions and hold ourselves aloof from all, recollected and reserved, they are consumed with jealousy and do everything they can until they have driven us from the monastery. Arrogance cannot bear to see itself scorned and humility held in honor. 14. A man full of self-esteem suffers torture when he sees a humble person weeping and being doubly compensated by God, who is moved to pity because of his tears, and by men who are moved to give him praise that he never sought. 15. Once you have entrusted yourself wholly to your spiritual father, you will find yourself alienated from all things human, worldly, or material that might lead you astray. Without his consent, you will not have any desire to concern yourself with such things, nor will you ask him to allow you anything, great or small, unless he himself on his own initiative either tells you to take it or gives it to you with his own hands. 16. Without the permission of your spiritual father, do not give alms from the money you brought with you, and do not even allow an agent acting on your behalf to distribute any of your wealth. It is better for others to regard you as poor and destitute than to distribute your wealth to those in need while you are still a novice. A person of pure faith will entrust everything to the decision of his spiritual father, as if putting it into the hands of God. 17. 
Even if you are burning with thirst, do not ask for a drink of water. Until, on his own initiative, your spiritual father urges you to drink. Constrain yourself. Force yourself in all things. Prevail over yourself. Saying to yourself, If God wills, and if you deserve a drink, God will certainly reveal this to your spiritual father and he will say to you, Drink. Thus, you will drink with a pure conscience even if it is not the correct moment to do so. 18. Someone with experience of spiritual grace and possessing an unadulterated faith once said, invoking God as witness of its truth, I resolved never to ask for anything, to eat or drink, from my spiritual father, or to take anything at all without his consent but to wait until God prompted him to give me an order. Acting in this way, I never deviated from my aim. 19. Whoever possesses unclouded faith in his spiritual father will, on seeing him, think that he is seeing Christ himself, when with him or following him he will firmly believe that he is with and following Christ. Such a person will never want to associate with anyone else nor will he value anything in the world more than his thought of him and his love for him. For what is finer and more profitable in this world, or in the next, than to be with Christ? What is more gracious or beautiful than the sight of him? If someone is privileged to enjoy his companionship, he draws from this eternal life. 20. If you truly love and pray for those who slander and maltreat you, who hate and defraud you, you will make rapid progress. For when your heart is fully aware that this is happening, your thoughts, and indeed your whole soul with all its three powers are drawn down into the depths of humility and washed with tears. This in its turn raises your intellect to the heaven of dispassion, conferring on it the gift of contemplation you come to regard all the things in this life as mere dross, so that you do not even take food or drink with pleasure or any frequency. 21. The spiritual contestant must not only abstain from evil actions, but must also strive to be free from hostile thoughts and notions. He should always concentrate on ideas of a soul-nourishing and spiritual nature, thus remaining detached from worldly cares. 22. A person who strips his whole body bare, but keeps his eyes covered with a cloth, cannot see the light despite of his nakedness. Similarly, a person detached from all things, including possessions, and even delivered from the passions themselves, will never see the spiritual light, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, until he frees his soul's eye from worldly concerns and evil thoughts. 23. Worldly thoughts and material concerns blind the mind or eye of the soul, like a cloth that covers the physical eyes. So long as we are not free of them we cannot see, but once they are removed by mindfulness of death, then we clearly see the true light that which illumines everyone who attains the spiritual world. 24. The person blind from birth will not recognize or believe the significance of what I have just written, but the person privileged with sight will bear witness that what I have said is true. 25. The person who sees with physical eyes knows when it is night and when it is day. The blind man is unaware of both. The person who has come to see with the eyes of the Spirit, and who has beheld the true and quenchless light, is consciously aware when he is deprived of it, should he return out of laziness to his former blindness, and he will not be ignorant of why this has happened. But the person blind from birth, and remaining so, knows nothing of these things, from personal experience of their operation, he knows about them only from hearsay, but has never actually seen them. And if he tells others what he has heard, neither he nor his audience will know what he is talking about. 
Twenty-six. We cannot both sate ourselves with food, and spiritually enjoy divine and numinal blessings. The more we pander to the stomach, the less we can experience such enjoyment. But to the degree that we discipline the body, we are filled with spiritual nourishment and grace. Twenty-seven. We should abandon all that is earthly. We should not only renounce riches and gold and other material things, but should also expel desire for such things completely from our soul. We should hate not only the body's sensual pleasure, but also its mindless impulses, and we should strive to mortify it through suffering. For it is through the body that our desires are roused and stirred into action, and so long as it is alive, our soul will inevitably be dead, slow to respond. And even impervious to every divine command. Twenty-eight. Just as a flame always rises, no matter in what direction one turns the wood on which it burns, so the heart of an arrogant person cannot humble itself. The more one says to help him, the greater his self-inflation. Corrected or admonished, he reacts violently, and when praised or encouraged, his exultation. Knows no bounds. Twenty-nine. A person in the habit of contradicting others becomes a two-edged sword to himself. Unwittingly, he destroys his own soul and alienates it from eternal life. Thirty. A contentious person is like someone who deliberately gives himself over to the enemies of his king. Contentiousness is a trap whose bait is self-justification. Deceived by it, we swallow the hook of sin. Then our unhappy soul is caught, tongue and throat, by the demons. Sometimes they exalt it to the heights of pride, and sometimes cast it down into the depths of sin, to be judged with those who have fallen from heaven. Thirty-one. A person who suffers bitterly when slighted or insulted should recognize from this. That he still harbors the ancient serpent in his breast. If he quietly endures the insult or responds with great humility, he weakens the serpent, and lessens its hold. But if he replies acrimoniously or brazenly, he gives it strength to pour its venom into his heart and to feed mercilessly on his guts. In this way, the serpent becomes increasingly powerful. It destroys his soul's strength, and attempts. To set himself right, compelling him to live for sin, and to be completely dead to righteousness. Thirty-two. If you want to renounce the world and to be instructed in life according to the Gospels, do not place yourself in the hands of an inexperienced master or one subject to the passions, for then you will be taught not the ways of the Gospels, but those of the devil. Good masters impart good teaching, but the evil teach evil. Bad seed produces rotten fruit. Thirty-three. Implore God with prayers and tears to send you a guide who is dispassionate and holy, but you yourself should also study the divine writings, especially the works of the fathers that deal with the practice of the virtues, so that you can compare the teachings of your master with them. For thus you will see and observe them, as in a mirror. Take to heart and keep in mind those of his teachings that agree with the divine writings, but separate out and reject those that are false and incongruent. Otherwise, you will be led astray. For in these days, there are all too many deceivers and false prophets. Thirty-four. A blind person who undertakes to guide others is a deceiver. Plunging into the pit of destruction, those who follow him, as the Lord said, "If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit." Matthew fifteen fourteen. Thirty five. The person blind to the one is utterly blind to everything, but he who sees in the one contemplates all things. He abstains from the contemplation of all things. And at the same time enters into the contemplation of all things while remaining outside what he contemplates. Being in the one, 
he sees all things, and being in all things, he sees nothing. The person who sees in the One perceives through the One both himself and all men and all things. Hidden in the One, he sees nothing of anything. 36. The person who has not consciously invested his intelligence and intellect with the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Heavenly One, man and God, is still but flesh and blood. He cannot perceive spiritual glory solely through his intelligence, just as those blind from birth cannot know the sun's light solely through their intelligence. 37. Whoever hears, sees, and feels through his intelligence will know the meaning of what has just been said, because he already bears the image of the Heavenly One. See 1 Corinthians 15, 49, and has attained that perfect manhood which is the fullness of Christ. See Ephesians 4, 13. Such a person can also guide God's flock aright in the way of his commandments. But if someone does not understand what has been said, it is clear that the perceptive organs of his soul are neither purified nor in good health, and that it would be better for him to be led than to lead others at their peril. 38. He who looks upon his teacher and guide as if he were God cannot call him into question. If he thinks and says that he can, he should know that he deceives himself, being ignorant of the attitude of holy men towards God. 39. If you believe that your life and death are in the hands of your spiritual guide, you will never contradict him. Ignorance of this engenders contentiousness, and this brings about spiritual and eternal death. 40. Before the accused receives his sentence, he is given an opportunity to speak in his own defense before the judge about what he has done. But once the facts have been established and the judge has given his verdict, the accused can say nothing, whether important or trivial, to those who execute his punishment. 41. Before a monk has entered this court and has revealed what he has in his heart, he may perhaps argue with his spiritual guide, either out of ignorance or because he thinks he can keep things about himself hidden. But after he has revealed and sincerely confessed his thoughts, he cannot argue with the man who, after God, will be his judge and master until death. For when a monk has once entered this court and laid bare the secrets of his heart, he will know from the start, if he has any understanding at all, that he deserves a thousand deaths. He will believe that through humility and obedience he can be saved from all punishment and chastisement, if indeed he has truly grasped the nature of this mystery. 42. If you keep these things indelibly in mind, your heart will never rebel when you are disciplined or admonished or criticized. But whoever falls victim to the evils of contentiousness and disbelief with respect to his spiritual father and teacher is, while yet living, dragged down pitifully into the depths of Hades. Being disobedient and a son of perdition, he becomes the dwelling place of Satan and all his unclean brood. 43. I exhort you, who are under obedience, to meditate on these things constantly and to make every effort not to plunge into these infernal evils of which I have spoken. Entreat God fervently each day with these words, God and Lord of all, Master of everything that has breath and soul, who alone canst cure me, hear my prayer, abject as I am. Root out of me and destroy, through the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, the serpent that dwells in me. Make me worthy, poor though I am, and bereft of virtue, of falling with tears at the feet of my spiritual Father. Move his holy soul to have mercy on me, and Lord, bestow humility on my heart, and give me such thoughts as befit a sinner who has resolved 
to repent before thee. Do not abandon forever a soul that has once submitted and has confessed to thee, that has chosen and honored thee above all the world. Thou knowest that I wish to be saved, even if my bad habits hinder me. But to thee, O Lord, are possible all things that are impossible to men. See Luke 18.27 44. Those who with fear and trembling have laid a good foundation of faith and hope in the court of devotion, who have planted their feet firmly on the rock of obedience to their spiritual father, who listen to his counsel as if it came from the mouth of God, and who with humility of soul build all this on the basis of obedience. Such people will succeed immediately. They will achieve that great and primary task of denying themselves. For to fulfill the will of another, and not one's own, entails not only the denial of one's own soul, but also mortification towards the whole world. 45. The demons rejoice when a person argues with his spiritual father, but angels marvel at him when he humbles himself to the point of death. For then he performs God's work, making himself like the Son of God, who was obedient to his Father unto death, the death on the cross. See Philippians 2, 8. 46. Contrition of heart, when excessive and untimely, troubles and darkens the mind destroying the soul's humility and pure prayer, and paining the heart. This includes a hardening to the point of total insensibility, and by means of this the demons reduce spiritual people to despair. 47. As you are a monk, such things may happen to you. If they do, you may still feel a great desire and eagerness for perfection, longing to fulfill all God's commandments, and not wanting to err or sin even by uttering a single idle word. See Matthew 12, 36. Or to fall short of the saints of old in the practice of virtue, in spiritual knowledge, and in contemplation. But then you may find yourself hampered by someone who sows tares of despondency. He tries to prevent you from climbing to such heights of holiness by discouraging you with various thoughts. For instance, he will tell you that it is impossible for you to be saved and to keep every single one of God's commandments while you live in this world. When this happens, you should sit down in a solitary place by yourself, collect yourself, concentrate your thoughts and give good counsel to your soul, saying, Why, my soul, are you dejected? And why do you trouble me? Put your hope in God for I will give thanks to him, for my salvation lies not in my actions, but in God. See Psalms 42, 5. Who will be vindicated by actions done according to the law? See Galatians 2, 16. No living person will be vindicated before God. See Psalms 143, 2. Yet by virtue of my faith in God, I hope that in His ineffable mercy He will give me salvation. Get behind me, Satan. See Matthew 4, 10 and 16, 23. I worship the Lord my God. See Matthew 4, 10 and Luke 4, 8 and serve Him from my youth. For He is able to save me simply through His mercy. Go away from me. The God who created me in his image and likeness will reduce you to impotence. 48. The only thing God requires of us is that we do not sin, but this is achieved not by acting according to the law, but by carefully guarding the divine image in us and our supernal dignity. When we thus live in our natural state wearing the resplendent robe of the Spirit, we dwell in God and God dwells in us. Then we are called gods by adoption and sons of God, sealed by the light of the knowledge of God. See Psalms 4, 6. 49. 
bodily listlessness and torpor, which affect the soul as a result of our laziness and negligence, not only make us abandon our normal rule of prayer, but also darken the mind and fill it with despondency. Then, blasphemous and cowardly thoughts arise in the heart. Indeed, the person tempted by the demon of listlessness cannot even enter his usual place of prayer. He grows sluggish and absurd thoughts directed against the Creator of all things arise in his mind. Aware of the cause of all this and why it has happened to you, resolutely enter your normal place of prayer, and falling down before the God of love, ask with a compunctive and aching heart, full of tears, to be freed from the weight of listlessness and from your pernicious thoughts. If you knock hard and insistently, this release will soon be given to you. 50. The person who has attained purity of heart has triumphed over cowardice. The person still in the process of being purified sometimes overcomes it and sometimes is overcome by it. The person not even engaged in spiritual warfare is either completely unaware that he is the ally of his own passions and of the demons, and that he is sick with pride and presumption, thinking he is something when he is not, or else he is the slave and servant of cowardice, trembling like a baby, and fearing fear, where for those who fear the Lord, there is no fear. Psalms 14, 5 Nor any occasion for cowardice. 51. Whoever fears the Lord will not fear the sickly attacks of demons or the threats of evil people. Like a flame of burning fire, he goes about day and night through dark and hidden places, and instead of fleeing from the demons he makes them flee from him, so as not to be scorched by the flaming rays of divine fire that pour from him. 52. Whoever goes in the fear of God is not afraid when surrounded by evil men, for he has the fear of God within him and wears the invincible armor of faith. This gives him strength to do all things, even those that seem to most people difficult or impossible, like a giant among monkeys or a roaring lion among dogs and foxes. He is resolute in the Lord, unnerving his enemies with the constancy of his purpose and filling their minds with terror, for he wields God's wisdom like a rod of iron. See Psalms 2, 9. 53. Not only the hesychast living alone or the monk under obedience, but also the abbot, the spiritual director of many, and even a monk charged with specific duties, need to be detached and completely free from all worldly cares. For if we are not detached, we transgress the commandment of God which says, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, or what you will wear. For it is the heathen who worry about all these things. Matthew 6, 25 and 32 And again, Take care that your heart is not weighed down by dissipation, drunkenness, and worldly cares. Luke 21.34 54. A person full of anxiety about worldly things is not free. He is dominated and enslaved by this anxiety, whether it is about himself or about others. But he who is free from such things is untroubled by worldly concerns, whether they relate to himself or to others. And this is so, even if he is a bishop, abbot, or priest. However, he will not be idle or neglect even the most insignificant and trivial details, but all he does he will do for the glory of God, accomplishing everything in his life without anxiety. 55. Do not pull down your own house because you want to build a house for your neighbor. Think how exhausting and difficult the task will be. Otherwise, you may make your decision only to find that having destroyed your own house, you lack the strength to build a house for someone else. 56. Unless you are completely detached from worldly affairs and possessions, 
do not voluntarily assume responsibility for such things. Otherwise, you may become caught up in them, and, instead of receiving the reward for your services, may find yourself accused of theft and sacrilege. But if your abbot compels you to act as a steward, be like someone who holds his hands in a flaming fire, and if you ward off the attacks of your own evil thoughts through repentance and confession, you will be kept unharmed through the prayers of your superior. 57. Unless you have become dispassionate, you cannot know what dispassion is, and will not believe that a dispassionate person exists anywhere on earth. For unless someone has first denied himself, readily giving his blood for the sake of a life that is truly blessed, how can he imagine that anyone else has done this in order to attain the state of dispassion? It is the same with someone who thinks that he possesses the Holy Spirit, while in fact he possesses nothing of the kind. When he hears about the workings of the Spirit in those who do possess him, he refuses to believe that there is anyone in our generation who is energized and motivated by the Holy Spirit, or who consciously and experientially enjoys the vision of Him, in the same way as Christ's apostles and saints from the beginning of the world. For each judges whether his neighbor's condition is virtuous or vicious, according to his own state. 58. A dispassionate soul is one thing, a dispassionate body is another. For the soul, when dispassionate, sanctifies the body with its own luminosity and with the radiance of the Holy Spirit. But bodily dispassion by itself confers no benefit on the person who possesses it. 59. A person who is raised by the king from extreme poverty to wealth, who is invested by him with high office and a splendid uniform, and commanded to stand in his presence, will be full of devotion for the king, and will revere him as his benefactor. He will be fully aware of his splendid robes, of his high office, and the wealth he has been given. Similarly, if a monk has truly withdrawn from the world and its affairs and has come to Christ, if he is fully conscious of his calling and has been raised to the heights of spiritual contemplation through the practice of the commandments, then he will look unwaveringly on God and be well aware of the change that has taken place in him. He will see the grace of the Spirit always illuminating him, the grace that is called a garment, the royal purple, or rather, that is Christ himself, if it is indeed true that those who believe in Christ are clothed in Christ. See Galatians 3.27 60. Many read the Holy Scriptures and hear them read, but few can grasp their meaning and import. For some what is said in the Scriptures is impossible, for others it is altogether beyond belief. Some again interpret them wrongly, they apply things said about the present to the future, and things said about the future to the past, or else what happens daily. In this way, they reveal a lack of true judgment and discernment in things both human and divine. 61. We, the faithful, should look upon all the faithful as a single being, and should consider that Christ dwells in each of them. We should have such a love for each of them that we are willing to lay down our lives for him. Nor should we ever think or say that anyone is evil. We should look on everyone as good, as I have already said. Even should you see someone overwhelmed by some passion, execrate not him, but the passions that fight against him. And if he is mastered by desires and prepossessions, have even greater compassion for him. For you too may be tempted, subject as you are, to the same fluctuations of beguiling materiality. 62. A person false through hypocrisy or culpable because of his actions or easily shattered by some passion or who lapses slightly through negligence must not be left in the company of those who are working together in harmony. On the contrary, he must be excluded from their society as still corrupt and reprobate. Otherwise, at some crucial moment, he might break their chain of union, causing division where there should be none. 
and distress, both to those who are at the head of the chain, for they will be grieved for those who follow after them, and to those at the tail of the chain, who will suffer because they are cut off from those in front of them. 63. Earth thrown on a fire puts it out. Similarly, worldly concerns and attachments to even the smallest and most insignificant thing quell the fervor initially burning in our hearts. 64. If you are pregnant with the fear of death, you will feel disgust for all food and drink and smart clothing. You will not even find pleasure in eating bread or drinking water. You will give your body only what it needs to keep alive, and you will not only renounce all self-will, but at the discretion of those to whom you are obedient, you will become the servant of all. 65. The person who from fear of punishment hereafter has placed himself as a slave in the hands of his spiritual fathers will not choose, even if commanded to do so, relief for his heart's suffering or deliverance from the bonds of his fear. Nor will he listen to those who out of friendship or flattery or in virtue of their authority encourage him to seek such relief and freedom. On the contrary, he will choose what increases his suffering and heightens his fear, and will look with love on whatever helps another to inflict these things on him. Moreover, he will endure as though he never expected to be released, for hope of deliverance lightens one's burden, and this is harmful for someone who is repenting fervently. 66. Fear of punishment hereafter and the suffering it engenders are beneficial to all who are starting out on the spiritual way. Whoever imagines that he can make a start without such suffering and fear, and without someone to inflict them, is not merely basing his actions on sand, but thinks that he can build in the air without any foundations at all. And this, of course, is utterly impossible. Indeed, the suffering is the source of nearly all our joy while the fear breaks the grip of all our sins and passions. And the one who inflicts these things brings us not death, but eternal life. 67. He who does not attempt to evade the suffering engendered by the fear of eternal punishment, but accepts it wholeheartedly and even adds to it as he can, will rapidly advance into the presence of the King of Kings. And as soon as he has beheld the glory of God, however obscurely, his bonds will be loosed. Fear, his tormentor, will leave him, and his heart's suffering will be turned to joy. It will become a spring from which increasing tears will flow visibly, and which will fill him spiritually with peace, gentleness, and inexpressible sweetness, as well as with courage and the capacity to submit to God's commandments freely and unreservedly. This is something impossible for those who are still beginners, for it is the characteristic of such as are in the middle of their spiritual journey. As for the perfect, this spring becomes a light within their hearts, suddenly changed and transformed as they are. 68. The person Inwardly illumined by the light of the Holy Spirit cannot endure the vision of it, but falls face down on the earth and cries out in great fear and amazement, since he has seen and experienced something that is beyond nature, thought, or conception. He becomes like someone suddenly inflamed with a violent fever, as though on fire, and unable to endure the flames, he is beside himself, utterly incapable of controlling himself and though he pours forth incessant tears that bring him some relief, the flame of his desire kindles all the more. Then his tears flow yet more copiously, and washed by their flow, he becomes even more radiant. When totally incandescent he has become like light, then the saying is fulfilled, God is united with gods, and known by them in the sense perhaps that he is now united to those who have joined themselves to him, 
and revealed to those who have come to know him. 69. Let no one deceive you with vain words. Ephesians 5, 6. And let us not deceive ourselves. Before we have experienced inward grief and tears, there is no true repentance or change of mind in us. Nor is there any fear of God in our hearts, nor have we passed sentence on ourselves, nor has our soul become conscious of the coming judgment and eternal torments. Had we accused ourselves and realized these things in ourselves, we would have immediately shed tears, for without tears our hardened hearts cannot be mollified, our souls cannot acquire spiritual humility, and we cannot be humble. If we do not attain such a state, we cannot be united with the Holy Spirit. And if we have not been united with the Holy Spirit through purification, we cannot have either vision or knowledge of God or be initiated into the hidden virtues of humility. 70. Those who simulate virtue and who because of the sheepskin of the monastic habit appear to be one thing outwardly but are something else inwardly, steeped perhaps in iniquity, jealousy, ambition, and foul pleasures, are revered by most people as saintly and dispassionate, for in most people the soul's eye is unpurified, and so they cannot recognize these impostors by their fruits. See Matthew 7, 15-16. Those, on the other hand, who are full of devoutness, virtue, and simplicity of heart, and who are truly saints, are judged by most people to be like other men, and they pass by them with disdain, counting them as nothing. 71. The garrulous and ostentatious man is thought by these people to be a spiritual master, but the quiet man, careful not to waste words, they regard as uncouth and inarticulate. 72. The arrogant, sick with diabolical pride, reject anyone inspired by the Holy Spirit, as if this saintly man were himself arrogant and filled with pride. For his words strike them like blows, yet do not move them to compunction. But whoever uses his inborn talents or education to spin long phrases, and who tells lies to people about their salvation, is welcomed by them and praised to the skies, and so no one among them is able to see the situation as it is, and judge it accordingly. 73. Blessed are the pure in heart, says God, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8. But purity of heart cannot be realized through one virtue alone, or through two, or ten. It can only be realized through all of them together, as if they formed but a single virtue, brought to perfection. Even so, the virtues cannot by themselves purify the heart without the presence and inner working of the Spirit. For just as the bronzesmith demonstrates his skill through his tools, but cannot make anything without the activity of fire, so a man using the virtues as tools can do everything given the presence of the fire of the Spirit. But without this presence, these tools remain useless and ineffective, not removing the stain that befouls the soul. 74. Through holy baptism we are granted remission of our sins, are freed from the ancient curse, and are sanctified by the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we do not as yet receive the perfection of grace as described in the words of Scripture. I will dwell in them and move in them. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. For that is true only of those who are steadfast in faith and have demonstrated this through what they do. If after we have been baptized we gravitate towards evil and foul actions, we lose the sanctification of baptism completely. But... Through repentance, confession, and tears, we receive a corresponding remission of our former sins, and in this way, sanctification, accompanied 
by the grace of God. 75. Through repentance the filth of our foul actions is washed away. After this we participate in the Holy Spirit, not automatically, but according to the faith, humility, and inner disposition of the repentance in which our whole soul is engaged. In addition, we must also have received complete remission of our sins from our spiritual father. For this reason, it is good to repent each day, in accordance with the commandment that tells us to do this. For the words, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Matthew 3, 2 Indicate that the act of repentance is unending. 76 The grace of the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge to souls that are betrothed to Christ, and just as without a pledge a woman cannot be sure that her union with her man will take place, so the soul will have no firm assurance that it will be joined for all eternity with its Lord and God, or be united with Him mystically or inexpressibly, or enjoy His unapproachable beauty, unless it receives the pledge of His grace and consciously possesses him within itself. 77. Just as an engagement is not binding unless the documents of the contract bear the signatures of trustworthy witnesses, so the illumination of grace is dependent upon the practice of the commandments and the actualization of the virtues. What witnesses are to a contract, the virtues and the practice of the commandments are to spiritual betrothal. Through them, everyone who is going to be saved secures the consummation of the pledge. 78. It is as if the contract were written through the practice of the commandments and then signed and sealed by the virtues. Only then does Christ, the bridegroom, give his ring, the pledge of the Holy Spirit, to the soul that is his bride-to-be. 79. Before the marriage, the bride-to-be receives nothing but the pledge given by her future husband. She waits until after the marriage to receive the dowry that has been agreed upon and the gifts promised with it. So the church, the bride-to-be, composed of all the faithful, and the soul of each of us first receives from Christ, the bridegroom-to-be, only the pledge of the Spirit, the eternal blessings of the kingdom of heaven, are given subsequent to this earthly life, though both the church and the individual soul have the assurance of them through the pledge they have received, in which, as in a mirror, what has been agreed is disclosed and confirmed by their Lord and God. 80. If the bridegroom-to-be is delayed abroad or kept away by other business and puts off the marriage for a while, and if the bride-to-be indignant rejects his love, erasing or tearing up the document that contains the pledge, she immediately loses all right to what she expected from him. The same is true where the soul is concerned. For if a person engaged in spiritual warfare should say, How long must I suffer? and begin to evade the rigor of the ascetic life, and, as it were, to erase or tear up the contract through neglect of the commandments, and by abandoning the constant task of repentance, then at once he forfeits completely the pledge given and his hope in God. 81. Should the bride-to-be transfer her love from the man to whom she is affianced to another sharing his bed, whether publicly or not, not only does she not receive anything of what her betrothed had promised her, but she may rightly expect the censure and punishment of the law. The same is true in our own case. If someone shifts the love he has for Christ, his betrothed, to the desire for some other thing, whether openly or in secret, and his heart is possessed by that thing, he will become hateful and abhorrent to Christ, and unworthy of being united with him. For it is written, I love them that love me. Proverbs 8, 17. 82. Each of us should be able to understand from these signs whether or not he has received the pledge of the Spirit from Christ our Lord and betrothed. If he has received it, 
he should strive to retain it, and if he has not yet been privileged to receive it, he should strive through good works and actions, and through fervent repentance, to receive it, and then to keep it through the practice of the commandments and the acquisition of the virtues. 83. The roof of a house rests on its foundations and walls. Correspondingly, the foundations themselves are laid in the manner required for them to serve as a support for the roof. A roof cannot stand without foundations, and foundations without a roof serve no living or practical purpose. Similarly, God's grace is preserved through the practice of the commandments, while the practice of the commandments is, as it were, the foundation of the divine gift. The grace of the Spirit will not remain with us without the practice of the commandments, nor will the practice of the commandments serve any useful purpose without the grace of God. 84. A house left without a roof, through the neglect of the builder, is not only useless, but brings ridicule on the builder. Similarly, a person who has laid foundations through the practice of the commandments and has raised walls through the acquisition of the higher virtues remains incomplete and an object of pity to the perfect. If he does not receive the grace of the Spirit in the form of contemplation and spiritual knowledge, he will have been denied this grace for one of two reasons. Either he has failed to repent, or daunted by the serried ranks of the virtues as by a boundless forest, he may have overlooked one of them, one that may seem trivial to us, but is indispensable if the house of the virtues is to be completed, since without it, that house cannot be roofed by the grace of the Spirit. 85. The Son of God, God Himself, came down to earth in order to reconcile us, His enemies, to His Father, and to unite us consciously to Himself through His holy and co-essential Spirit. How, then, can someone who lacks this grace of the Spirit achieve any other form of grace? Certainly he has not been reconciled to Christ, nor has he been united to Christ through participation in the Spirit. 86. The person who participates in the Holy Spirit is freed from impassioned desires and sensual pleasures, but he is not divorced from his natural bodily needs. In virtue of his deliverance from the bonds of impassioned desire and his union with immortal tenderness and glory, he strives, unflaggingly, to attain the heights, to dwell there with God, and not to lose even for a moment his vision of God and his insatiable delight. But because he is fastened to the body and to corruption, he is dragged down and pulled along by them, and is turned towards earthly things. His distress at this must be as great, I imagine, as that of a sinner's soul when it is separated from the body. 87. For someone who loves the body, mortal life, sensual pleasure, and the material world, separation from them is death. But for someone who loves holiness, God, the immaterial world and virtue. True death is for the mind to be separated from them, even briefly. If the eyes of a person who can see sensible light are closed for an instant or covered by someone else, he suffers and is distressed and cannot bear it, especially if he was looking at something important or unusual. But if someone is illumined by the Holy Spirit, and whether asleep or awake, sees spiritually, those blessings that the eye has not seen, and the ear has not heard, and man's heart has not grasped, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and that angels long to glimpse, 1 Peter 1, 12, how much more will he suffer and be tormented if he is torn away from the vision of these things? For this will seem to him like death, a veritable exclusion from eternal life. 88. Many have called the eremitic life blessed, others the communal or cenobitic life. Others, again, have described in this way leadership of the faithful, or the counseling, teaching, 
and administration of churches. All of these are activities that provide people with nourishment in body and soul. But, for my part, I would not judge any of them to be better than the others, nor would I say that one merits praise and another censure. But in every case, whatever our work or activity, it is the life led for God and according to God that is most blessed. 89. Man's material life is based upon a variety of sciences and skills, each person practicing one or another of them and making his contribution. Thus, by giving and taking from one another, men satisfy their natural bodily needs. One can see the same thing among spiritual people, where one person pursues one virtue while another follows another path, but all are moving towards a single goal. 90. The goal of all who pursue the spiritual path is to do the will of Christ, their God, to be reconciled with the Father through communion in the Spirit, and so to achieve their salvation. For only in this way is the soul's salvation attained. And if it is not attained, our labor is fatuous and our work vain. Every path of life is pointless that does not lead the person pursuing it to this consummation. 91. The person who, totally forsaking the world, retires to the mountains as though in pursuit of stillness, and who then, showily writes to those in the world, blessing some and praising and flattering others, is like someone who, after divorcing a foul and slatternly whore of a wife, and going off to a distant land to expunge even his memory of her, then forgets why he came there and longs to write to those living with that whore and sullied by her, even deeming them happy. If not bodily, at least in heart and in intellect, he shares their passions, inasmuch as he deliberately condones their commerce with that woman. 92. Those who purify their senses and hearts from every evil desire while living in the world indeed deserve praise and are surely blessed. Correspondingly, those who dwell in mountains and caves but who pursue human praise and blessing deserve censure and rejection. In the eyes of God, diviner of our hearts, they are adulterers. For the person who wants his life and name and ascetic practice to be known in the world prostitutes himself in God's sight, as according to David, the Jewish people once did. See Psalms 106, 39. 93. Whoever renounces the world and worldly things with unhesitating faith in God believes that the Lord is compassionate and merciful, and that He receives those who come to Him in repentance. But he knows, too, that God honors his servants with dishonor, enriches them with the utmost poverty, and glorifies them by means of insults and scorn, making them through death participants and inheritors of eternal life. Through such trials the servant of God is impelled like a panting heart to the deathless fountain. See Psalms 42, 1. And through them he climbs upwards, as though up a ladder on which angels ascend and descend. See Genesis 28, 12, and John 1, 51. In order to help those who are mounting, God is enthroned above, observing the strength of our intention and diligence, not because He enjoys seeing us struggle, but because He wishes, compassionate as He is, to give us our reward as if it were something he owed us. 94. The Lord never allows those who come to him unhesitatingly to fall completely. When he sees them faltering, he helps them in their efforts, stretching a hand of power down to them and drawing them up to himself. He works with them visibly and invisibly, consciously and unconsciously, until having climbed up every step of the ladder, they draw near Him, wholly united with Him in His wholeness, and forgetting all that is earthly. Whether they are there with Him in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. 
See 2 Corinthians 12, 2. But they dwell with him and enjoy his ineffable blessings. Saint Simeon, the New Theologian 153 Practical and Theological Texts 95. It is right for us to place the yoke of Christ's commandments on our shoulders from the start, and we should not resist or hang back. On the contrary, we should walk straight ahead wholeheartedly, obedient to them, making ourselves in truth the new paradise of God, until the Son comes to dwell in us with the Father through the Holy Spirit. Then, when He totally indwells us, and is our Master, whomever of us He commands, and whatever ministry He entrusts us with, we will take it in hand and carry it out sedulously, as seems best to Him. But we must not seek this ministry prematurely, or consent to accept it when given by men but we must persevere in the commandments of our Lord and God and await His orders. 96. If, after we have committed ourselves to some form of ministry within the Church and have performed it honorably, the Spirit should then direct us to some other ministry or work or activity, we should not resist. For God does not want us to be idle but neither does he want us to be confined forever to the first work in which we engaged. On the contrary, he wants us to advance, moving always towards the realization of something better, acting in accordance with his will and not our own. 97. Whoever strives to mortify his own will should follow the will of God, and in the place of his own will he should put God's will planting it in himself and grafting it into his heart. Moreover, he should carefully observe whether what he has planted has put down deep roots, whether what he has grafted has healed over so as to make a single tree, and whether it has grown and flowered and borne good, sweet fruit in such a way that he no longer recognizes the earth into which the seed was sown or the stalk onto which the graft was made. So incomprehensible and miraculous is the life-bearing tree that has grown up. 98. If through fear of God you cut off your own will, inexplicably for you do not know how this happens, God will give you His will. You will keep it indelibly in your heart, opening the eyes of your mind so that you recognize it, and you will be given the strength to fulfill it. The grace of the Holy Spirit operates these things. Without it, nothing is accomplished. 99. If you have received the remission of all your sins, either through confession or through putting on the holy and angelic habit, this will be a great source of love, thanksgiving, and humility for you. For not only have you been spared the countless punishments that you deserved, but you have been granted sonship, glory, and the kingdom of heaven. Bear this in mind and continually meditate on it, taking care never to dishonor him who honored you and has forgiven you ten thousand sins. Glorify and honor him in all you do, so that in return he will glorify you even more, you whom he has honored above all visible creation and has called his true friend. 100. As the soul is more precious than the body, so man endowed with intelligence excels the whole world. When you contemplate the grandeur of the created things with which the world is filled, do not think that they are more precious than you are, but keeping in mind the grace that has been given you and aware of the value of your deiform soul, Celebrate the God who has honored you above all visible things. 101. Let us consider how we should glorify God. We cannot glorify Him in any way other than that in which He was glorified by the Son. For in the same way as the Son glorified the Father, 
the Son in turn was glorified by the Father. Let us then diligently use the same means to glorify Him who allows us to call Him our Father in heaven, so that we may be glorified by Him with the glory that the Son possesses, with the Father prior to the world. See John 17, 5. These means are the cross, or death to the whole world, the afflictions, the trials, and the other sufferings undergone by Christ. If we endure them with great patience, we imitate Christ's sufferings, and through them we glorify our Father and God, as His sons, by grace, and as co-heirs of Christ. 102. A soul not consciously and completely free from ties and attachments to the visible world is not able to endure serenely the calamities and ravages with which both men and demons assail it. Bound by its attachment to human concerns, it is lacerated by the loss of material things, suffers when deprived of possessions, and is full of distress when its body is afflicted. 103. A person who has delivered his soul from its ties with and desire for sensible things, and has bound it to God, will not only scorn property and possessions, accepting their loss painlessly as if they belonged to others and were not his own, he will also endure bodily distress with joy and gratitude. In the words of St. Paul, he sees the outward self perishing but the inward self being renewed day by day. See 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Otherwise it is impossible joyfully to bear the afflictions permitted by God, for this requires perfect knowledge and spiritual wisdom. He who lacks these things walks at all times in the darkness of ignorance and hopelessness, totally incapable of beholding the light of patience and benediction. 104. Anyone who thinks himself intelligent because of his scholarly or scientific learning will never be granted insight into divine mysteries unless he first humbles himself and becomes a fool. See 1 Corinthians 3.18 Discarding both his presumption and the knowledge that he has acquired. But if he does this, and with unhesitating faith allows himself to be led by those wise in divine matters, he will enter with them into the city of the living God. Guided and illumined by the Divine Spirit, he will see and learn what others cannot ever see or learn. He will then be taught by God. See John 6, 45. 105. Those taught by God will be regarded as fools by the disciples of such as are wise in the wisdom of this world. But, in fact, it is the worldly wise that are fools, spouting an inane secular wisdom, the stupidity of which God has demonstrated. See 1 Corinthians 1, 20, and which Scripture condemns as material, unspiritual, devilish, filled with strife and malice. See James 3, 15. Since these people are blind to the divine light, they cannot see the marvels it contains. They regard as deluded those who dwell in that light, and see and teach others about what is within it. On the contrary, it is they themselves that are deluded, not having tasted the ineffable blessings of God. 106. Even now, living in our midst, there are people who are dispassionate and saintly, filled with divine light, who have so mortified whatever in them pertains to the earth. See Colossians 3, 5. Freeing it from all impurity and impassioned desire, that not only do they themselves not think or act maliciously, but even when drawn in this direction by another, they are unwavering in their dispassion. Those who accuse these saints of folly, and who do not believe them when in the wisdom of the Spirit they teach us about divine matters, would have recognized them had they understood the sacred writings that are read and sung daily. 
For if they possessed a mature knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, they would have believed in the blessings spoken of and bestowed on us by God. But because out of self-conceit and negligence they do not share in these blessings, in their unbelief they slander those who do share in them and who teach others about them. But because out of self-conceit and negligence they do not share in these blessings, in their unbelief they slander those who do share in them and who teach others about them. 107. For this reason, those filled with grace and perfect in spiritual knowledge and wisdom will meet and see people living in the world only in order to benefit them in some way, through reminding them of God's commandments, or by doing good. There is a chance that some will listen, understand, and be persuaded. For those not led by the Spirit of God walk in darkness and do not know where they are going. See John 12, 35. Or what are the obstacles that make them stumble? Yet, perhaps one day they may recover from their presumption and accept the true teaching of the Holy Spirit, learning about the will of God in all its purity and integrity. They may repent, carry out this will, and receive some share in spiritual grace. But if these holy people cannot in this way benefit those living in the world, they return to their cells, lamenting the hardness of heart they have encountered, and they pray day and night for the salvation of such as are still in darkness. To those who dwell constantly with God and are more than abundantly filled with every blessing, this is the only thing that causes sadness. 108. What is the purpose of the incarnation of the divine Logos which is proclaimed throughout the scriptures, about which we read, and which yet we do not recognize? Surely it is that he has shared in what is ours, so as to make us participants of what is his. For the Son of God became the Son of Man, in order to make us human beings sons of God, raising us up by grace to what he is by nature giving us a new birth in the Holy Spirit and leading us directly into the kingdom of heaven. Or rather, he gives us the grace to possess this kingdom within ourselves. See Luke 17, 21. So that not merely do we hope to enter it, but being in full possession of it, we can affirm, our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3. 109. Baptism does not take away our free will or freedom of choice, but gives us the freedom no longer to be tyrannized by the devil, unless we choose to be. After baptism, it is in our power either to persist willingly in the practice of the commandments of Christ, into whom we were baptized, and to advance in the path of his ordinances, or to deviate from this straight way, and to fall again into the hands of our enemy, the devil. 110. Whoever after baptism deliberately submits to the will of the devil and carries out his wishes, estranges himself, to adapt David's words, from the holy womb of baptism. See Psalms 58, 3. None of us can be estranged or alienated from the nature with which we are created. We are created good by God, for God creates nothing evil, and we remain unchanging in our nature and essence as created. But we do what we choose and want, whether good or bad, of our own free will. Just as a knife does not change its nature, but remains iron, whether used for good or for evil, so we, as has been said, act and do what we want, without departing from our own nature. 111. To be merciful to just one person will not save you, but to scorn just one person will send you to the fire. See Matthew 18, 10. The words, I was hungry, and I was thirsty. Matthew 25, 35 were spoken with reference not merely to a single occasion or to a single day, 
but to the whole of our life. Thus our Lord and God has declared that He accepts from His servants food, drink, clothing, and so on, not once only, but always, and in all things. 112. Even though we may have been charitable to a hundred people, if there were others from whom we turned away when they asked for food and drink, and we could have given it to them, we will be judged by Christ as having refused Him nourishment. For Christ, whom we nourished in the humblest of people, is in all those to whom we refused our charity. 113. He who today gives to all everything they need, and tomorrow, though still in the position to act in a similar way, neglects some of his fellow beings and allows them to perish of hunger, thirst, or cold, has scorned and allowed to die him who said, Inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these my kindred, you have done it to me. Matthew 25, 40 114. Christ takes on the appearance of each of the poor and assimilates himself to all of them, so that no one who believes in him will be arrogant towards his fellow being. On the contrary, he will look on his fellow being and his neighbor as his God, regarding himself as least of all in comparison just as much with his neighbor as with his Creator, honoring his neighbor as if he were his Creator, and exhausting his all in his service, just as Christ our God poured out his blood for our salvation. 115. We who have been commanded to regard our neighbor as ourself, see Leviticus 19, 18, and Luke 10, 27, should do so not for one day only, but for our whole life. Similarly, we who have been told to give to all who ask, see Matthew 5, 42, are told to do this for our whole life. And if we would like others to do good to us, we should ourselves act in the same way towards them. See Matthew 7, 12. 116. Whoever regards his neighbor as himself cannot bear to possess more than his neighbor. On the other hand, if he has more, and does not give unstintingly until he himself has become as poor as his neighbor, he fails to fulfill the Lord's commandment. And if someone wishes to give to all who ask but rejects one of them, while he still has a penny or a scrap of bread, or if he does not act towards his neighbor as he would like other people to act towards him, he too is failing to fulfill the Lord's commandment. Similarly, if you provide for even the humblest of the poor, and give him drink and clothe him, and so on, but ignore a single person whom you know to be hungry and thirsty, you will be regarded as having ignored Christ our God when he was hungry and thirsty. 117. This may seem extremely severe, and you may well say to yourself, Who can do all this? Who can care and provide for everyone and not ignore anyone? But let us listen to what St. Paul explicitly states. For the love of Christ impels us to pronounce this judgment, that, since one has died for all, therefore all have died. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. 118. Just as the more comprehensive commandments contain within themselves all the more particular commandments, so the more comprehensive virtues contain in themselves the more particular virtues. For he who sells what he has and distributes it to the poor, see Matthew 19, 21, and who once and for all becomes poor himself, has fulfilled at once all the more particular commandments. He no longer has to give alms to the person who asks him for them, nor does he have to refrain from rejecting the man who wishes to borrow from him. See Matthew 5, 42. So too, someone who prays continuously, see 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, has in this act included everything 
and is no longer obliged to praise the Lord seven times a day. See Psalms 119, 164. Or in the evening, in the morning, and at noonday. See Psalms 55, 17. He has already done all that we do by way of prayer and psalmody, according to the regulations and at specific times and hours. Similarly, he who has acquired consciously within himself the teacher of spiritual knowledge, see Psalms 94, 10, has gone through all scripture, has gained all that is to be gained from reading, and will no longer have need to resort to books. How is this? The person who is in communion with him who inspired those who wrote the divine scriptures and is initiated by him into the undivulged secrets of the hidden mysteries will himself be an inspired book to others, a book containing old and new mysteries and written by the hand of God. For he has accomplished all things, and in God, the principle of perfection, he rests from all his labors. 119. Emission of semen in sleep may be produced by many factors. It may be due to gluttony, or self-esteem, or the envy of the demons. It may occur after long vigils when the body is sluggish and ready for sleep. It may happen because of the fear that it may happen, especially if one is a priest due to celebrate the liturgy, or intends to receive Holy Communion. Filled with anxious thoughts that this might happen, one falls asleep only to have it happen. This, too, is brought about by the envy of the demons, or it may be that after seeing a lovely face during the day, one then recalls it mentally and falls asleep, full of unchaste thoughts, which one fails to repel because of one's sluggishness. Thus, one lapses while asleep or even while lying awake in bed. Or certain individuals, negligent as I see it, may sit and talk, perhaps impassionately, perhaps not, about things involving the passions. Then when they go to bed, they turn those things over in their mind, dropping off to sleep while thinking about them, and come under their spell during sleep. It may even happen during the conversation itself, one person being perverted by another. We should therefore always be attentive to ourselves and reflect on the prophet's words. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, so that I shall not be shaken. Psalms 16, 8 And we should not listen to such talk. Often, even those engrossed in prayer are physically aroused, as I have stated in the text on prayer. 120 Brother, at the beginning of your renunciation of the world, try hard to implant in yourself noble virtues, so that you become useful to the community, and so that the Lord may finally exalt you. Do not try to be familiar with the abbot, as we have already said elsewhere, or request any honor from him. Do not seek friendship with the senior members of the community, and do not hang about their cells. For if you do, not only will the passion of self-esteem begin to take root in you, but you will be disliked by the superior. Why this is so will be clear if you think about it. Sit peacefully in your cell, whatever it is like. If someone wants to contact you, do not spurn him on the grounds that he disturbs your devotions, provided that you meet him with the consent of your spiritual father. You will come to no harm even if the visitor has been sent to you by the enemy. But if you see that no good comes from the meeting, you should follow the path that is of profit to you. 121. At all times you should fear God, and every day you should examine yourself to see what good things you have done and what bad things. And you should forget what was good, lest you succumb to the passion of self-esteem. But where what was bad is concerned, you should weep, confess, and pray intensely. This self-examination should take place as follows. 
When the day has ended and evening has come, ask yourself how, with God's help, you have passed the day. Did you judge anyone, speak harshly of anyone, or offend anyone? Did you look impassionately at anyone? Or did you disobey your superior with regard to your duties and neglect them? Did you become angry with anyone or occupy your mind with useless things while in church? Or overcome by lethargy, did you leave church or depart from your rule of prayer? When you see that you are guiltless on all counts, which is impossible, for no one is free from stain, not even for a single day of his life, see Job. 14, 4 through 5. And who will boast that his heart is pure? See Proverbs 20, 9. Then cry out to God full of tears, Lord, forgive me all my sins, in thought or act, consciously or unwitting, for we offend in many ways and do not know it. 122. Each day you should reveal all your thoughts to your spiritual father, and you should accept with complete confidence what he says to you, as if it came from the mouth of God. Do not speak of any of this to anyone else, saying, When I asked my spiritual father such and such a thing, he said this or that. Was that good counsel or not? And what should I do to heal myself? Words like these display lack of trust in your spiritual father and injure the soul. Mostly, they occur in the case of beginners. 123. You should look on all who are in the monastery as saints and regard only yourself as a sinner and as the least of all, thinking that on that day all will be saved and you alone will be punished. And when you are in church reflecting about these things, weep bitter tears of compunction, taking no account of those who will be shocked by this or mock such behavior. But if you see that as a result of this you are slipping into self-esteem, leave the church and weep in secret, returning as soon as you can to your place. This is particularly valuable in the case of beginners, especially during the six psalms, the Psalter, the readings, and the divine liturgy. Be careful not to condemn anyone, but keep it in mind that all who see your distress will think that you are a great sinner and will pray for your salvation. If you think of this at all times and carry it out constantly, you will be greatly helped, attracting to yourself God's grace and becoming a participant in His divine blessings. 124. Do not visit the cell of anyone except the abbot, and this rarely. Even if you want to ask the abbot about some thought, do this in church. After the service, return at once to your cell. From there, go to carry out your duties. After compline, prostrate yourself before the abbot's door, ask for his prayers, and then, head down, hurry silently back to your cell. For it is better to repeat the Trisagion prayer once with attention before going to bed than to pass a four-hour vigil in idle talk. Where there are compunction and spiritual grief, there is also divine illumination. When this is present in you, listlessness and sickness are dispelled. 125. Do not permit yourself to feel special love for anyone in particular for a novice, even if his way of life seems excellent and much more so if it is suspect. Generally, such love, even if initially spiritual, changes into an impassioned love and results in useless afflictions. This tends to happen especially to those engaged in spiritual warfare, as one may learn through humility and constant prayer. This is not the right occasion for me to speak about these matters in detail, but he who has understanding will understand. 126. Be a stranger to every brother in the monastery, and even more to all whom you know in the world. Love everyone equally 
and look on all those devoutly engaged in spiritual warfare as saints. For those who are negligent, as we ourselves are, we must pray intensely. But nevertheless, as I said above, we should regard all as saints, and should strive, through inward grief, to be purified of our passions, so that illumined by grace we may look on all as equals, and attain the blessing of those who are pure in heart. See Matthew 5, 8. 127. Brother, regard perfect withdrawal from the world, first as the complete mortification of your own will. In the second place, regard it as detachment from and abjuration of parents, family, and friends. 128. In the third place, you must divest yourself of all that belongs to you and give it to the poor. In accordance with the words, Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Matthew 19.21 Then you must forget all with whom you enjoyed a particular relationship of love, whether physical or spiritual. 129. You must confess all the secrets of your heart, all that you have done from your infancy until this very hour, to your spiritual father, or to the abbot as if to God himself, the diviner of hearts and minds. Do this in the knowledge that John baptized with the baptism of repentance, and that all came to him confessing their sins. See Matthew 3, 6. As a result of this, your soul will experience great joy, and your conscience will find relief, in accordance with the words of the prophet. First, declare your sins so that you may be set free. See Isaiah 43, 26. 130. Be fully persuaded that after your entry into the monastery your parents and all your friends are dead, and regard solely God and the abbot as your father and mother. Never ask anything of parents or friends on account of some bodily need. If in their concern they send you something, accept it and be grateful for their solicitude, but give whatever they send to the guest house or to the hospital. Do this with humility, for it is not a sublime, but an insignificant act. 131. Do everything good with humility, keeping in mind him who said, When you have done everything, say, We are useless servants. We have only done what was our duty. Luke. 17, 10. 132. Take care never to receive communion while you have anything against anyone, even if this is only a hostile thought. Not until you have brought about reconciliation through repentance should you communicate, but you will learn this too through prayer. 133. You should be ready each day to receive all kinds of afflictions, regarding them as your release from many sins, and you should thank God for them. Through them, you may acquire a close and unimpeachable communion with God, in accordance with St. Paul's words. Afflictions produce patient endurance, patient endurance, strength of character, and strength of character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Romans 5, 3-5 through 5. For the things that the eye has not seen, and the ear has not heard, and man's heart has not grasped, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, these things belong, according to the infallible promise, to those who, with the help of God's grace, patiently endure affliction. Without God's grace, we can of course do nothing. 134. Have nothing material in your cell, not even a needle, except for a rush mat, your sheepskin, your cloak, and whatever else you wear. If possible, do not have a stool there. There is much to be said on this matter, but let him who has understanding understand. 135. Again, do not ask the abbot for any appurtenances 
other than those prescribed, and take these only when he calls you and himself gives them to you. Resist any thought of exchanging them for others. Accept them as they are with thanksgiving, as if they had been given by God, and manage with them. It is not permitted to buy others. You should wash your outer garment twice a year if it becomes dirty. And, like some unknown beggar, you should ask your brother in all humility for something to wear until it has been washed and dried in the sun. Then you should return what you have borrowed with thanks. You should do the same with your cloak and any other clothing. 136. Perform the various duties assigned to you as well as you can. In your cell, persevere in prayer with compunction, attentiveness, and constant tears. You should not think that because you have worked exceptionally hard today, you should reduce your prayer on account of bodily exhaustion. For however greatly you exert yourself in performing your duties, you should be aware that you have lost something of great value if you deprive yourself of prayer. For this is in fact the case. 137. You should arrive first at the church services, especially matins and the liturgy, and leave last, unless forced to do otherwise. 138. You should be completely obedient to your abbot, from whom you received the tonsure, and should fulfill his orders uncritically until your death, even if they seem impossible to you. In this way you will imitate him who was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Philippians 2, 8. You should obey in everything not only the abbot, but all the brotherhood, and whoever is in charge of the various tasks that have to be done. And if you are told to do something beyond your power, make a prostration and ask forgiveness. Should this be refused, remember that the kingdom of heaven is entered forcibly, and those who force themselves take possession of it. Matthew 11, 12 And apply force to yourself. 139 Whoever with a contrite heart prostrates himself before the entire brotherhood as a person of no account, utterly inconspicuous, a non-entity, and who lives in this way throughout his life, will receive, I declare, the gift of insight, and will foretell many things about the future with the help of God's grace. Such a person will also grieve for the faults of others. Moreover, he will be undistracted by attachment to material things, since the intensity of his love for what is divine and spiritual will not permit him to stumble because of them. There is nothing marvelous about foretelling things of the future. Often indeed it is prompted by the demons, as he who has understanding will understand. But if a person begins to hear confessions, he may perhaps be deprived of these gifts, since he will then be busied with the examination of other people's thoughts. If, on the other hand, out of great humility, he stops hearing confessions and giving counsel, he may again recover his previous gift of insight. But God alone has knowledge of these things. As for myself, constrained by fear, I dare not to speak of them. 140. You should always direct your intellect towards God, whether asleep or awake, eating or talking, engaged in your handiwork or in any other activity. Thus you will fulfill the saying of the prophet, I have set the Lord always before me. Psalms 16, 8. Reckon yourself a greater sinner than anyone else, for if you persist in this state of recollectedness, illumination will enter your mind like a ray of light, and the more you aspire to such illumination, attentive and undistracted, striving and tearful, the more clearly it will shine. When it shines it is loved, and when it is loved it purifies, and as it purifies it makes one godlike enlightening one and teaching one to distinguish good from evil. But, my brother, much hard work is needed, and God's help. 
before this radiance and dwells totally in your soul and illumines it as the moon illumines the darkness of the night. You must also pay attention to the thoughts of arrogance and presumption which attack you, and not condemn anyone when you see him doing something wrong. For when the demons see the soul freed from passions and temptations, through the indwelling of grace and the resulting state of peace, they attack it through such thoughts. But help comes from God. Let your inward grief be continuous and your tears unquenchable. Yet take care not to harm yourself because of your great joy and compunction. Recognize that they are the result not of your own labor, but of God's grace. Otherwise they may be taken from you, and when you urgently seek them again in prayer, you will not be able to recover them. You will then know what a gift it is that you have lost. May we never, O Lord, be deprived of thy grace. Yet, if this does happen to you, my brother, cast your weakness before the Lord, and standing up, stretch forth your hands and pray, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, abject and weak as I am, and grant me thy grace, not allowing me to be tested beyond my capacity. See, Lord, to what despondency and bad thoughts my sins have led me. Lord, even if I wish to, I cannot measure the loss of thy benediction. Brought about by the demons and my own presumption, I know that the demons range themselves against those who zealously fulfill thy will. But since I daily do what they want, how is it that I am afflicted by them? I am tried constantly by my own sins. Yet now, Lord, if it is thy will, and to my benefit, let thy grace enter thy servant once again, so that aware of it I may rejoice with tears and compunction, illumined by its eternal radiance. Guard me from unclean thoughts, from everything evil, from the sins I commit daily in word or act, consciously or unwittingly. May I be given the confidence to call upon thee freely. O Lord, from amidst all the afflictions that I suffer daily at the hands of men and demons, and cutting off my own will, may I be mindful of such blessings stored up for those that love thee. For thou hast said, Lord, that he who asks receives, that he who seeks finds, and that the door will be opened to whoever knocks. See Matthew 7, 8. In addition to saying these, and other things that God puts into your mind, persevere in prayer, not allowing yourself to grow slack through listlessness, and God, in His love, will not abandon you. 141. Persevere until the end, in the cell initially allotted to you by your superior. If you are troubled because of its age or dilapidation, make a prostration before your superior and humbly mention the matter to him. If he hears you sympathetically, rejoice. If not, give thanks anyway, remembering our Lord who had nowhere to lay his head. See Matthew 8, 20. For if you disturb the superior about this a second time, then a third, and fourth time, insolence will result, then lack of trust, and finally disdain. So if you want to lead a quiet and peaceful life, do not ask your superior for any bodily comfort, for it was not to this that you dedicated yourself when originally making your monastic vows, but you consented to be despised and scorned by all, in accordance with the Lord's commandment, and to endure manfully. If you want to maintain your trust in and love for your superior, and to look on him as a saint, Make sure of these three things, that you do not ask him for any comfort, that you do not take any liberties when speaking with him, and that you do not keep visiting him, as some do, on the grounds that he helps them. This is not perseverance, but human failing. On the other hand, I do not condemn the practice of not hiding from him any distractive thought that comes into your mind. For if you maintain this practice, you will pass over the sea of life smoothly and will regard your spiritual father, whatever he may be like, as a saint. Should you approach him in church in order to question him about a distractive thought, but find that someone else has anticipated you for the same purpose, 
or for some other reason, and that you are therefore ignored for a short while, do not take it amiss or think anything hostile. Stand by yourself with hands folded until the other person has finished and you are called forward. The fathers often act in this way, perhaps deliberately, testing us and releasing us from the sins we have committed. 142. You should observe the great Lenten fast by eating every third day, not counting Saturdays and Sundays, unless there is a major feast. During the other two main fasts, before Christmas and before the feast of the Dormition, you should eat every other day. On the remaining days of the year, you should eat once only, except on Saturday and Sunday, and on feast days, but do not eat to repletion. 143. Strive to become for the whole community a good example of every virtue, of humility, gentleness, act of compassion, obedience, even in the least of things, freedom from anger, detachment, unpossessiveness and compunction, guilelessness and uninquisitiveness, of simplicity and estrangement from the world. Visit the sick, console the distressed, and do not make your longing for prayer a pretext for turning away from anyone who asks for your help. For love is greater than prayer. Show sympathy towards all. Do not be arrogant or over-familiar. Do not find fault with others, or ask for anything from the abbot or from those in charge of various monastic tasks. Be respectful towards all priests, attentive in prayer, frank and loving towards everyone, and do not ransack the scriptures for the sake of glory. Prayer accompanied by tears, and illumination given by grace, will teach you how to accomplish all this. Whoever it may be who seeks your assistance and asks for your guidance, with great humility and self-effacement give advice as God's grace inspires you about the different forms of holy action, using your own life as the model, but referring to it as though it were that of someone else. And do not reject anyone who seeks your help with regard to some distractive thought, but listen to his sins, whatever they may be, weeping and praying for him. For this, too, is a sign of love and perfect compassion. Do not repel someone who comes to you on the grounds that you might be harmed by hearing what he has to say. With the help of God's grace, you will not be harmed in any way. So that no one else may be scandalized, you should speak in some secluded place. Being human, you may be attacked by some distractive thought, but if God's grace is present in you, such a thing will not happen to you. In any case, we are taught to seek not our own good, but that of others, so that they may be saved. See 1 Corinthians 10, 24, and 33. As we have already said, you should keep your life free from worldly concerns and possessions. You may recognize that grace is active within you when you truly feel that you are a greater sinner than all other men. How this happens, not I, but only God can say. 144. When keeping vigil, you should read for two hours, pray for two hours with tears and compunction, Go through whatever you choose of your own rule of prayer, and repeat, if you wish, the twelve psalms, Psalms 119, and the prayer of St. Estratios. Do this when the nights are long. When they are shorter, abbreviate the sequence of prayers by reading in accordance with the strength given you by God. For without Him, nothing good is accomplished. As the prophet says, The steps of a man are guided by the Lord. Psalms 37, 23. And our Savior Himself has said, Without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Never go to communion without tears. 145. You should eat what is put in front of you, no matter what it is, and take wine with uncomplaining self restraint. If because of sickness you are having your meals by yourself, eat raw vegetables with olives. But if one of the brethren should send you something to eat, receive it with humility and thanks, as if you were a guest, and eat some of it, whatever it may be, sending what is left over to another brother, poor and pious. 
Should someone invite you to a meal, partake of all that is put in front of you, but eat only a little, maintaining your self control in accordance with the commandment. Then, having stood up and bowed before him as though you were destitute and a stranger, thank him, saying, May God give you your reward, Holy Father. Be careful to say nothing else, even though it might possibly be of help. 146. If some brother badly upset by the abbot, or the steward, or by someone else, should come to you, encourage him in this way. Believe me, brother, this has happened in order to test you, for the same thing has happened to me in various ways, and because of my faint-heartedness I was grieved. But once I realized that these things occur in order to test us, I have endured them gratefully. You should do the same now, and be glad for such trials. Even if he then begins to abuse you, still, do not turn away from him, but console him in whatever way God's grace enables you to do so. We have to distinguish between many different situations. According to your knowledge of your brother's state, and his thoughts, talk to him, and do not let him go away unhealed. 147. If one of the brethren falls ill and you visit him only after some time, first, send him a message. Holy Father, I learnt about your illness only today, and I ask your forgiveness. Then go and see him, and after making a prostration and receiving his blessing, say to him, How has God helped you, Holy Father? Then, sitting down with your hands folded, be silent. Even if there are others visiting him at the same time, be careful not to say anything either about the scriptures or about his health, especially when not asked, so that you will not be troubled afterwards. For this is what happens generally to the more simple brethren. 148. If you are having a meal with your brethren, eat unhesitatingly of what is presented to you, whatever it may be. If, however, you have been told not to eat fish or some other food, and it is offered to you, should the person who gave you the order be close at hand, go to him, and request him to let you partake. But should he not be present, or if you know that he would not give his permission, and at the same time you do not wish to offend your hosts, tell him what you have done after you have eaten, and ask his forgiveness. If you are unwilling to do either of these things, it is better for you not to visit your brethren. For in this way you will be greater in two respects. You will escape the demon of self-esteem, and at the same time, spare them offense and distress. If the foods offered to you are on the rich side, keep to your rule. Yet even in this case it is better to take a little of everything. In short, when you are invited somewhere, apply the principle laid down by St. Paul. Eat all that is set before you, without raising questions of conscience. See 1 Corinthians 10.25 149. If one of the brethren knocks on your door while you are praying in your cell, open it for him, and sit down and talk with him humbly provided he proposes a topic of conversation that has some positive purpose. If he is distraught, do what you can, through word or act, to rally him. But when he has gone, close your door, and take up your prayer again, and complete it. To comfort those who visit you is a form of reconciliation, but you should not act in this way with regard to non-monks. In their case, you should complete your prayer, and then, speak with them. 150. If, while you are praying, you feel frightened, or hear some noise, or if a light shines around you, or something else happens, do not be troubled, but concentrate all the more fully on your prayer. Demonic disturbances, alarms and excursions occur so that you will lose heart and give up your prayer. Then, if this happens regularly, you will fall into the demon's power. But if, as you pray, another light, beyond description, appears to you, 
and your soul is filled with joy, and you feel a desire for higher things, and tears of compunction flow. Know that this is a divine visitation and succor. Should this state continue for a long time, recapture your intellect in case something more happens to you because of the anguish of your tears, and submit it to some physical activity, thereby humbling yourself. If it is your enemies that are trying to frighten you, take care not to abandon your prayer. Be as the child, who frightened by some hobgoblin, dispels his terror by flying into the arms of his mother or father. Resort to God through prayer, and you will find that you escape the fear which the demons provoke. 151. If while you are still sitting in your cell, one of the brothers comes to you and asks about carnal warfare, do not turn him away, but with compunction help him, using what God's grace has given you and what you have yourself learnt through your own experience, and then dismiss him. As he leaves, however, make a prostration before him and say, Believe me, brother, I have hope that through God's love this war you wage will end. Only do not give in or relax. When he has gone, stand up, recall his struggle, and lifting your hands with tears towards God, pray with all your heart for your brother, saying, O Lord God, who do not desire the death of a sinner, act as you know how, and as will benefit this brother. And God, who knows your brother's faith in you, and your compassion born of love, and the genuineness of your prayer on his behalf, will diminish this warfare for him. 152. All those things, brother, help you to acquire compunction. They should be carried out with a contrite heart, patience, and thanksgiving. They will cause you to shed tears, cleansing you of your passions, and will bring you to the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is entered forcibly, and those who force themselves take possession of it. Matthew 11.12 if you can accomplish these things, you will leave your former way of life completely behind and may even be freed from the attacks of distractive thoughts. For darkness gives way to light and a shadow to the sun. But should someone at the start of the spiritual path neglect these things, growing sluggish in thought and full of curiosity, he will be deprived of grace. Then, falling a victim to evil passions, he will come to know his own weakness and be filled with fear. Yet the person who successfully accomplishes these things should realize that this is the result, not of his own efforts, but of God's grace. He should purify himself first in accordance with the saying, First purify yourself, and then speak to him who is pure. For he who through many tears has purified his intellect and has received the illumination of the divine light, light that would grow no less even if everyone received it, will dwell spiritually in the age to come. 153. Saint Simeon, the new theologian, was once asked what a priest ought to be like, and he replied as follows, I am not worthy to be a priest, but I know very well what someone who is to celebrate the sacred mysteries of God should be like. In the first place, he should be chaste, not only in body, but also in soul, and he should be free of all sin. Secondly, he should be humble, both in his external manner and in the inner state of his soul. Then, when he stands before the holy altar, while gazing with his physical eyes on the holy gifts, spiritually, and with total certainty, he should perceive the Godhead. Moreover, his heart should be consciously aware of him who is invisibly present and dwelling in the gifts, so that he may offer the petitions with confidence. And, when like a friend speaking to a friend, he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Matthew 6, 9 The way in which he recites the prayer will show that he has dwelling within him the true Son of God, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I have seen such priests. Forgive me, fathers and brethren. 
He also spoke the following words, as if about someone else, thereby concealing himself so as to avoid human abjulation, even though because of his love for others he felt at the same time compelled to reveal himself. A certain priest monk, who had full confidence in me as his friend, once told me this, I have never celebrated the liturgy without seeing the Holy Spirit, just as I saw him come upon me when I was ordained, and the Metropolitan said the prayer while the service book rested on my head. When I asked him how he saw it at that time, and in what form, he said, undifferentiated and without form, except as light. At first I was astonished, beholding what I had never beheld before, and I was asking myself what it might be. The light said to me, its voice heard only by the intellect, Thus have I appeared to all the prophets and apostles, and to those who are now the saints and the elect of God. For I am the Holy Spirit of God. To him be glory and power through all the ages. Amen. Saint Simeon the New Theologian The Three Methods of Prayer There are three methods of prayer and attentiveness by means of which the soul is either uplifted or cast down. Whoever employs these methods at the right time is uplifted, but whoever employs them foolishly and at the wrong time is cast down. Vigilance and prayer should be as closely linked together as the body to the soul, for the one cannot stand without the other. Vigilance first goes on ahead like a scout and engages sin in combat. Prayer then follows afterwards, and instantly destroys and exterminates all the evil thoughts with which vigilance has already been battling, for attentiveness alone cannot exterminate them. This, then, is the gate of life and death. If by means of vigilance we keep prayer pure, we make progress. But if we leave prayer unguarded and permit it to be defiled, our efforts are null and void. Since then, as we said, there are three methods of attentiveness and prayer, we should explain the distinctive features of each, so that he who aspires to attain life and wishes to set to work may with firm assurance select what suits him best. Otherwise, through ignorance he may choose what is worse and forfeit what is better. The First Method of Prayer The distinctive features of the first method of prayer are these. When a person stands at prayer, he raises hands, eyes, and intellect heavenwards, and fills his intellect with divine thoughts, with images of celestial beauty, of the angelic hosts, of the abodes of the righteous. In brief, at the time of prayer he assembles in his intellect all that he has heard from Holy Scripture and so rouses his soul to divine longing as he gazes towards heaven, and sometimes he sheds tears. But when someone prays in this way, without him realizing it, his heart grows proud and exalted, and he regards what is happening to him as the effect of divine grace, and entreats God to allow him to always be engaged in this activity. Such assumptions, however, are signs of delusion, because the good is not good, when it is not done in the right way. If, then, such a person is pursuing a life of stillness and seclusion, he will almost inevitably become deranged, and even if this does not happen to him, it will be impossible for him to attain a state of holiness or dispassion. Those who adopt this method of prayer have also been deluded into thinking that they see lights with their bodily eyes, smell sweet scents, hear voices, and so on. Some have become completely possessed by demons and wander from place to place in their madness. Others fail to recognize the devil when he transforms himself into an angel of light. See 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And putting their trust in him, they continue in an incorrigible state of delusion until after their death, refusing to accept the counsel of anyone else. Still, others incited by the devil have committed suicide, 
throwing themselves over a precipice or hanging themselves. Indeed, who can describe all the various forms of deception employed by the devil? Yet, from what we have said, any sane person can understand the kind of harm that may result from this first method of attentiveness, even if someone who has adopted this method may perhaps avoid the evils we have mentioned because he lives in a community. For it is solitaries who are especially subject to them. Nonetheless, he will pass his entire life without making any progress. The Second Method of Prayer the second form of prayer is this. A person withdraws his intellect from sensory things and concentrates it in himself, guards his senses, and collects all his thoughts, and he advances oblivious to the vanities of this world. Sometimes he examines his thoughts, sometimes pays attention to the words of the prayer he is addressing to God, and sometimes drags back his thoughts when they have been taken captive, and when he is overcome by passion, he forcefully strives to recover himself. One who struggles in this way, however, can never be at peace or win the crown of victory. He is like a person fighting at night. He hears the voices of his enemies and is wounded by them, but he cannot see clearly who they are, where they come from, and how and for what purpose they assail him. Such is the damage done to him because of the darkness of his intellect. Fighting in this manner, he cannot ever escape his noetic enemies, but is worn out by them. For all his efforts he gains nothing. Falsely imagining that he is concentrated and attentive, he falls victim, unawares to self-esteem. Dominated and mocked by it, he despises and criticizes others for their lack of attentiveness. Imagining that he is capable of becoming the shepherd of sheep, he is like the blind man who undertakes to lead the blind. See Matthew. 15, 14. Such are the characteristics of the second method of prayer, and everyone striving after salvation can see what harm it does. Yet the second method is better than the first, just as a moonlit night is better than a night that is pitch dark and starless. The Third Method of Prayer Let us now begin to speak about the third method of prayer which is truly astonishing and hard to explain. For those ignorant of it, it is not only difficult to understand but virtually incredible, and there are very few to be found who practice it. It seems to me that it has deserted us along with the virtue of obedience, for it is the love of obedience that delivers us from entanglement with this evil world, rendering us free from anxiety and impassioned craving. It makes us wholehearted and unflagging in pursuit of our aim, provided, of course, that we find an unerring guide. For if through obedience you make yourself dead to every worldly and bodily attachment, how can anything transient enslave your intellect? If you entrust all the care of your soul and body to God and to your spiritual Father, no longer living for yourself or desiring the good opinion of others, what anxiety can distract you? This third method, then, destroys the invisible wiles of the demons, with which, as with ropes, they seek to drag down the intellect into all manner of devious thoughts. Set at liberty, the intellect wages war with its full strength, scrutinizing the thoughts insinuated by the enemy and with masterful dexterity expelling them, while the heart in its purity offers prayers to God. This is the beginning of a life of true seclusion, and those who fail to make such beginning exhaust themselves in vain. The starting point of this third method of prayer is not to gaze upwards, to raise one's hands aloft, to concentrate one's thoughts and to call down help from heaven. These, as we said, are the marks of the first form of delusion. Nor does it begin as the second method does by keeping guard over the senses with the intellect while failing to observe the enemies who attack from within. In such a case, a person is struck by demons instead of striking them. When wounded, he is unaware of it. Taken captive, he cannot retaliate against his captors. His enemies constantly attack him from behind and even face to face and fill him with self-esteem and arrogance. If you desire to embark on this light-giving and joyful task, begin as follows. 
you must first practice exact obedience, as described above, and so act always with a pure conscience, for without obedience it is impossible for your conscience to be pure. And you must keep your conscience pure in three respects. First, with respect to God. Second, with respect to your spiritual father. And third, with respect to other people and to material things. With respect to God, you must keep your conscience pure by refraining from doing anything that conflicts with the worship due to Him. With respect to your spiritual father, do everything he tells you to do, neither more nor less, and be guided by his purpose and will. With respect to other people, you must keep your conscience pure by not doing to them anything that you hate. See Tobit 4.15 And that you do not want them to do to you. With respect to material things, you must take care not to misuse them, whether food, drink, or clothing. In brief, do everything as if you were in the presence of God, so that your conscience does not rebuke you in any way. Having cleared the ground and indicated in a preliminary way the true character of attentiveness, let us now speak clearly and concisely about its characteristics. True and unerring attentiveness and prayer mean that the intellect keeps watch over the heart while it prays. It should always be on patrol within the heart, and from within, from the depths of the heart, it should offer up its prayers to God. Once it has tasted within the heart that the Lord is bountiful, see Psalms 34, 8, then the intellect will have no desire to leave the heart, and it will repeat the words of the Apostle Peter, It is good for us to be here. Matthew 17, 4 It will keep watch always within the heart, repulsing and expelling all thoughts sown there by the enemy. To those who have no knowledge of this practice, it appears extremely harsh and arduous, and indeed it is oppressive and laborious, not only to the uninitiated, but also to those who, although genuinely experienced, have not yet felt the delight to be found in the depths of the heart. But those who have savored this delight proclaim with St. Paul, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Romans 8.35 Our holy fathers hearken to the Lord's words, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, unchastity, thefts, perjuries, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. Matthew 15, 19-20 And they also hearken to him when he enjoins us to cleanse the inside of the cup, so that the outside may also be clean. See Matthew 23.26 Hence they abandon all other forms of spiritual labor and concentrated wholly on this one task of guarding the heart, convinced that through this practice they would also possess every other virtue, whereas without it no virtue could be firmly established. Some of the fathers have called this practice stillness of the heart, others attentiveness, others the guarding of the heart, others watchfulness and rebuttal, and others again the investigation of thoughts and the guarding of the intellect. But all of them alike worked the earth of their own heart, and in this way they were fed on the divine manna. See Exodus 16, 15. Ecclesiastes is referring to this when he says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and walk in the ways of your heart. Ecclesiastes 11, 9. Blameless, expelling anger from your heart. And, if the spirit of the ruler rises up against you, do not desert your place. Ecclesiastes 10, 4. By place, meaning the heart. Similarly, our Lord also says, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Matthew 15, 19. And, do not be distracted. Luke 12.29 And again, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life. Matthew 7.14 Elsewhere he also says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Matthew 5.3
That is to say, blessed are those who are destitute of every worldly thought. St. Peter says likewise, Be watchful, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8 And St. Paul writes very plainly to the Ephesians about the guarding of the heart. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12 And so on. And our holy fathers have also spoken in their writings about guarding the heart, as those who wish can see for themselves by reading what St. Mark the Ascetic, St. John Climacus, St. Isichios the priest, St. Philotheos of Sinai, St. Isaiah the Solitary, and St. Varsanufios, and the entire book, known as The Paradise of the Fathers, have to say about the subject. In short, if you do not guard your intellect, you cannot attain purity of heart, so as to be counted worthy to see God. See Matthew 5, 18. Without such watchfulness, you cannot become poor in spirit, or grieve, or hunger and thirst after righteousness, or be truly merciful, or pure in heart, or a peacemaker, or be persecuted for the sake of justice. See Matthew 5, 3 through 10. To speak generally, it is impossible to acquire all the other virtues except through watchfulness. For this reason, you must pursue it more diligently than anything else, so as to learn from experience these things, unknown to others, that I am speaking to you about. Now, if you would like to learn also about the method of prayer, with God's help, I will tell you about this too, in so far as I can. Above all else, you should strive to acquire three things and so begin to attain what you seek. The first is freedom from anxiety with respect to everything, whether reasonable or senseless. In other words, you should be dead to everything. Secondly, you should strive to preserve a pure conscience so that it has nothing to reproach you with. Thirdly, you should be completely detached so that your thoughts incline towards nothing worldly, not even your own body. Then. Sit down in a quiet cell, in a corner by yourself, and do what I tell you. Close the door and withdraw your intellect from everything worthless and transient. Rest your beard on your chest and focus your physical gaze, together with the whole of your intellect, upon the center of your belly or your navel. Restrain the drawing in of breath through your nostrils so as not to breathe easily, and search inside yourself with your intellect, so as to find the place of the heart, where all the powers of the soul reside. To start with, you will find there darkness and an impenetrable density. Later, when you persist and practice this task day and night, you will find, as though miraculously, an unceasing joy. For as long as the intellect attains the place of the heart, at once it sees things of which it previously knew nothing. It sees the open space within the heart and it beholds itself entirely luminous and full of discrimination. From then on, from whatever side a distractive thought may appear, before it has come to completion and assumed a form, the intellect immediately drives it away and destroys it with the invocation of Jesus Christ. From this point onwards the intellect begins to be full of rancor against the demons and rousing its natural anger against its noetic enemies. It pursues them and strikes them down. The rest you will learn for yourself, with God's help, by keeping guard over your intellect and by retaining Jesus in your heart. As the saying goes, Sit in your cell, and it will teach you everything. Question why cannot the monk attain perfection by means of the first and second form of keeping guard? Answer. Because he does not embark on them in the proper order. St. John Climacus likens these methods to a ladder, saying some curtail their passions, other practice psalmody, persevering most of the time in this, others devote themselves to prayer, and others turn their gaze to the depths of contemplation. When examining this question, let us use the analogy of a ladder. Now those who want to ascend a ladder do not start at the top and climb down, but start at the bottom 
and climb up. They ascend the first step, then the second, and so the rest in turn. In this way we can ascend from earth to heaven. If, then, we wish to attain the perfect stature of the fullness of Christ, like children who are growing up, we must start to climb the ladder set before us, until progressing, step by step, we reach the level of a full-grown man, and then of an old man. The first age in the monastic state is to curtail the passions. This is the stage of beginners. The second rung or stage whereby a person grows up spiritually from adolescence to youth is assiduously to practice psalmody, for when the passions have been curtailed and laid to rest, psalmody brings delight to the tongue and is welcomed by God, since it is not possible to sing to the Lord in a strange land. See Psalms 137, 4. That is to say, from an impassioned heart. This is the mark of those who are beginning to make progress. The third rung, or stage in life, making the spiritual transition from youth to manhood, is to persevere in prayer. This is the stage of those who are already well advanced. Prayer differs from psalmody just as the full-grown man differs from the youth and the adolescent, according to the scheme that we are following. In addition, there is a fourth rung, or stage, in spiritual life, that of the old man with gray hairs. This signifies undeviating absorption in contemplation, and this is the state of the perfect. So the journey is complete, and the top of the ladder has been reached. Since this is the way in which matters have been appointed and arranged by the Spirit, it is not possible for a child to grow up to manhood and to attain old age except by mounting the first rung of the ladder and so climbing up to perfection by the four steps in succession. For someone who desires spiritual rebirth, the first step towards the light is to curtail the passions, that is to say, to guard the heart, for it is impossible otherwise to curtail the passions. The next stage is to devote oneself to psalmody, for when the passions have been curtailed and laid to rest, through the heart's resistance against them. Longing for intimate union with God inflames the intellect. Strengthened by this longing, the intellect repulses all distractive thoughts that encircle the heart, attempting to get in, and it rebuffs them through attentiveness. So it applies itself assiduously to the second stage, that of attentiveness and prayer. This then stirs up the evil spirits and the blasts of passion violently agitate the depths of the heart. But through the invocation of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are utterly rooted, and all the tumult melts like wax in the fire. But though they have been driven out of the heart, the demons continue to disturb the intellect externally through the senses. However, because they can only trouble it superficially, the intellect soon regains its serenity. Nonetheless, it can never be completely free from the attacks of the demons. Such freedom is to be found only among those who have attained full manhood, who are totally detached from everything visible, and who devote themselves unceasingly to giving attention to the heart. After that, those who have achieved attentiveness are raised little by little to the wisdom of old age. That is to say, they ascend to contemplation, and this is the stage of the perfect. Thus, if you practice all this, in due sequence, completing each phase at the right time, your heart will first be cleansed of the passions, and you will then be able to concentrate wholly on psalmody. You will be able to wage war against the thoughts that are roused by the senses and disturb the surface of the intellect, and you will gaze heavenwards, if need be, alike with your physical and your spiritual eyes, and will pray in true purity. Yet you should gaze upwards only occasionally because of the enemies that lie in ambush in the air. God asks only this of us, that our heart be purified through watchfulness. As St. Paul says, If the root is holy, so also will the branches and the fruit be holy. See Romans 11, 16. But if without following the sequence of which we have spoken, you raise your eyes and intellect to heaven, in the hope of envisaging noetic realities, you will see fantasies rather than the truth. 
because our heart is still unpurified. As we have said many times, the first and second methods of attentiveness do not promote our progress. When we build a house, we do not put on the roof before laying the foundations. This is impossible. We first lay the foundations, then build the house, and finally put on the roof. We must do the same in relation to spiritual matters. First, we must lay the spiritual foundations of the house. That is to say, we must watch over the heart and curtail the passions arising from it. Then we must build the walls of the spiritual house. That is to say, through the second form of attentiveness we must repulse the turbulence of the evil spirits that fight us by means of the external senses and must free ourselves as quickly as possible from their attacks. Then we must put on the roof. That is to say, detach ourselves entirely from all things and give ourselves wholly to God. In this way we complete our spiritual house in Christ Jesus our Lord, to whom be glory throughout all the ages. Amen.